I don't like the way this economy is acting. It's evil. The economy is now part of my access of evil. Presidential impersonation is a comedy institution in the United States, from risky radio performances in the 1920s to the dominance of Saturday Night Live today. And though we mostly look to impersonation as a source of entertainment, its history highlights a transforming presidency, and its political implications reveal one of the biggest paradoxes behind American democracy. It started in 1928 with Will Rogers, one of the most important comedians in American history. They won't let anyone talk politics in here because this stadium was dedicated to art, sports, and uh, any uh, useful enterprise. Uh, <laughs> An estimated 40 million people read his nationally syndicated column, where he discussed politics and American life. He was one of the first radio stars, the second biggest movie actor, the biggest name in vaudeville, and a world record holding trick roper. He was huge. It's hard for Americans today in our fragmented media landscape to appreciate just how ubiquitous Will Rogers was. That's Peter M. Robinson, an expert on the relationship between humor and the presidency. So in the middle of a 1928 radio broadcast, Rogers announced that then-President Calvin Coolidge was coming on to speak, and he proceeded to impersonate the president on air. There's no recording of this, but a transcript does survive. He pretty much just said a bunch of nonsense and some topical jokes. The public absolutely hated it. Many believed it was really Coolidge speaking, and they were upset to find out Rogers had tricked them. Rogers had such power that he had the pull to convince the president of the United States to join him on a radio broadcast. Confusion aside, the public felt as if Rogers was demeaning the presidency in a way that was dangerous. The following day, Rogers used his column to defend his choice to impersonate the president. The public seemed more upset than the president himself. Rogers sent a heartfelt letter to President Coolidge apologizing, saying that he could see now that it was not the proper thing to do under any circumstance. Coolidge replied that he found the matter of rather small consequence but there was a strong sense that Rogers had crossed the line. I think in retrospect, he realizes that he's doing something daring and new and not altogether appropriate. Years later, Rogers would also imitate President Roosevelt on air with pretty much the same results. Rogers sent a telegram apologizing, and FDR replied saying that he liked it a lot. After Will Rogers tried and failed, impersonation stayed far away from the mainstream. It wasn't until the Kennedy years that presidential impersonation came back big time. Von Meter was a young stand-up comic in New York City. He would do an act where he pretended to be President Kennedy. The crowd loved him. Now, just a minute, who do you think you are? Now, let me say this about that. Number one, you are, he's not an expert on politics, but I am. A couple of producers scouted out the act, and the result was The First Family. It is not with uh, too much concern that I say a uh, raise from uh, 25 to 35 is not completely out of accord when compared with the uh, current uh, financial deficit on hand. Now, I trust that answers your uh, question about your weekly allowance, Caroline. <laughs> Next question. The First Family was a monster hit. It won Album of the Year at the Grammys and became the fastest selling pre-Beatles album of all time, selling a million copies in its first week. The First Family aligned the American electorate with the presidency, an institution that had seemed heretofore so remote. Although many still felt that the impersonation was disrespectful, its commercial success was undeniable. As busy as you are, Mr. President, is uh, some of the burden of your office taken off of your shoulders by Lyndon Johnson. Who? Oh. Everyone heard the record, the president included. Can you tell us uh, whether you read and listen to these things and whether they produce annoyment or enjoyment? <laughs> <laughs> annoyment. Uh, no, they do. Right? Yes, I have read them. Actually, I listened to Mr. Meade's record, but I thought it sounded more like Teddy than it did me, but... Uh... That's John F. Kennedy avoiding the question. In private, he expressed some discomfort about the album and talked to his press secretary about potentially getting the FCC involved. He was trying to play it both ways. He understood at that point the political value in showing good humor. You'll notice that this impression is far from biting. It's good humored and by today's standards, totally harmless. Uh, the question was, how am I gonna prove foreign affairs in the next few months? Well, we're gonna try to keep everyone here. <laughs> in a paper discussing the rhetorical power of comedic presidential impersonation, Will Howell and Trevor Perry Giles described this era from Will Rogers in 1928 to Von Meter in 63 as one of accepting presidential impersonation. Impressions in this period were benign amusements, cautious not to cause offense. Rogers had met Coolidge, and he was friends with Roosevelt. 
The liner notes of the first family read, No one has more respect for the high offices and the people suggested here than those who had a hand in putting this together. Almost identical to what Rogers wrote in his apology letters. This era came to an abrupt end. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade. President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern. After the Kennedy assassination, nobody wanted to see an impersonator. Von Meter went from a household name to a total pariah and completely disappeared from public life. The following decade would be a turning point in Americans' relationship with the presidency. The war in Vietnam keeps on a raging. Blacks and whites still haven't worked it out. Five people have been arrested and charged with breaking into the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee. No wonder everybody's dropping out. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. During this period, American trust in government plummeted, a trend which has continued to today's historic lows. This kind of humor, mimicry and otherwise, is an egalitarian response to uses of power that came out of Vietnam and seemed to accelerate through Watergate. In this climate of mistrust, presidential impersonations became a staple of American comedy. It's Saturday night! Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. That's Chevy Chase as Gerald Ford in the first season of Saturday Night Live. His impression didn't look or sound like Ford, but it got enough attention that SNL's 17th guest was Ford's actual press secretary, Ron Nesson. Because you see, sometimes they poke uh, a little fun at you on the show. It's all in good fun, and I, and I think it'd be a good idea to show that you can take a joke. This is the beginning of the second <laughs> era of presidential impersonation. But I won't have this high office ridiculed. I won't be stumbling around and fooling around. <laughs> In its 44 seasons, SNL has played presidents across eight administrations and seven election cycles. There is a case to be made that these impressions have shaped the identity of candidates in the electorate's mind, and in some cases helped or hindered specific campaigns. And I can see Russia from my house. According to Howell and Perry Giles, Saturday Night Live has served to reconcile the human flaws of the president with the high office they occupy. Can I just read you one more juicy passage? This is, this is from a lady who calls herself Mrs. Jones. They point out that impersonation is a form of catharsis, especially useful during transition periods when the flaws of the president must be smoothed over in order to have a functional country. I'm not afraid to say recession, recession, recession. Peter Robinson makes a similar argument. Impersonation is a very efficient celebration of that great American joke. He's referring to an idea from literary scholar Lewis Rubin Jr. As Robinson explains in his book, the joke is the fact that Americans have imbued their nation with the most perfect of ambitions, yet entrusted their attainment to imperfect creatures like themselves. On the one hand, we have these founding ideals of expression and personal liberty, and yet on the other hand, we are flawed, often laughably so, human beings. In other words, the great American joke is the absurd notion that any one person could be the embodiment of the ideals enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. This is the paradox of American democracy. There will always be a gulf that must be bridged. And from that incongruence, impersonation gets its fuel. Which brings us to Trump. We're gonna build the wall, we have no choice. We not that Trump, this Trump. I moved on her like a bitch, but I couldn't get there. No, sorry, that's not true. Baldwin's Trump is unlike any other SNL president. Howell and Perry Giles call it a definite, perhaps calculated break with previous comedic presidential impersonations. Whereas previous impressions serve to reconcile the man and the president, Baldwin's Trump is doing the opposite. Google, what is ISIS? Baldwin impersonates Trump to be personally deplorable and irreconcilable with the expectation of his elected office. Well, thank you, judge, or what do you call a lady judge, a uh, flight attendant, something like that. Baldwin's Trump is corrupt and conspiring on multiple fronts, racist, sexist, vulgar, dishonest, and mean. Listen, sweetheart, I'm about to be president. We're all gonna die. Next question. <laughs> Other impersonators have assumed the same kind of characterization. Notably, Anthony Tamanik was impersonating Trump since the early primaries. Family, you want to keep family tight? Well, my family's the tightest, specifically my daughter. Tamanik went on to star in The President's Show, which was highly experimental and vehemently anti-Trump. Interestingly, Tamanik would sometimes step outside of character to more cuttingly criticize Trump, leaving no room for misinterpretation. And then I can come in, label it fake news, and rob us of a real dialogue about the responsibilities of the fourth estate. 
Despite Atamanik's extensive and sometimes novel uses of impersonation, Baldwin's Trump was similarly politically motivated, and it received the president's attention. Trump has directly and publicly attacked Baldwin and SNL, something entirely unprecedented. This is what Howell and Perry Giles argue might be the third era of presidential impersonation, motivating political action, but only among those who already oppose Trump. The Trump presidency has given new meaning to the great American joke. From Will Rogers to today, impersonators have pointed to and thereby helped us accept the president's inability to be a perfect avatar of American ideals. And those presidents knew to laugh along, recognizing their own imperfection, or at least pretending to when they didn't. In his response to comedy and in his policy, Trump is rejecting these values and institutions and asking instead that we follow a man. Lately, we seem to be turning that relationship on its head. And I don't lay all the blame for that on Trump, that somehow it is the person of the president who is to be trusted. When Trump says, believe what I say, pay no attention to the media, when the institutions that are built upon the founding documents, whether it's the justice system, whether it's the notion of a free and unfettered press, that those are the things that are flawed. That's what's not funny, but laughable. I think that's troubling. Hey, thanks for watching. A very special thanks to Peter Robinson for giving his time and sharing some of his resources. If you want to learn more about his topic, definitely check out his book, The Dance of the Comedians. Subscribe for future essays and take care.